just have a uh, you know panel discussion with all our uh, speakers today and uh, you can ask all your queries any doubts even if they are uh, small specific doubts please don't hesitate uh, i think one common question in everybody's mind is how to choose a sub specialty because we've all spoken about particular sub specialties and how to go about pursuing your fellowship in your spe sub specialty but uh most of the residents or newly passed out uh, uh you know young surgeons one doubt in their mind is how do i choose my specialty so i mean if some one of you could uh, tell us perhaps chasnal madam how you chose pediatric orthopedics and uh, how should others you know uh, go ahead and choose their specialties so like i mentioned that if you have not decided during the uh, residency which branch you want to take take up a sr ship in a place where you get a exposure to all the fields and maybe then you can develop interest that which one you want but whatever you like the most you should do that not because xyz branch gives more money or there's less work in some field don't do that if you like it you'll excel in that field so but just take what you like and try to get exposed suppose during your residency you didn't get exposed to spine so find a place where there is more work go there maybe you might end up having more interest in spine as well so i think a sr ship might help okay sometimes for me the internship helped i had decided in internship to take up on to pediatric orthopedics no ortho <laughs> okay and i wanted to do spine the best part was i wanted to do spine and then eventually i did pediatric pediatric orthopedics okay <laughs> sir uh, if you could share some so i think most of the times the sub specialty interest is uh, determined by uh, the person who has inspired you the most or your teacher you know at, at different points in your career you will come across a lot of people who uh, you would want to sort of you know look up to or you would want to emulate their practice their mannerisms their behavior and that sort of you know also shapes into a sub specialty having said that it is not necessary to settle down into a sub specialty as dr samir dalvi mentioned in the morning you know or you can sort of preempt what is going to come next like someone was like dr uh, was mentioning about foot and ankle that we are lagging 15 years behind yeah, so yeah. whether uh, it is going to come in so either you can be uh, someone who would see the future and want to settle in that specialty no matter how interesting or boring it is but i think it's more so who has influenced you and whom you chose to emulate because the gist of whatever has mm. happened in the morning everyone has said that fellowship is more like an apprenticeship nothing happens in the short term it is a long term thing and you apart from surgical skills you are going to pick up a lot of life skills from the person whom you are uh, working with so it's more like an apprenticeship that you just shadow him see how it work it was and whether you want to do the same thing so would you uh, think that it is a good idea to you know spend some time in all specialties before deciding or you know if during your residency you like something just go in with it and uh, uh, you know pursue that because you somebody might not be you know exposed to spine or say tumors in the residency so 100% get exposed to everything you have to be a good generalist first to be a specialist so uh, there is a interesting book called range so that range that the title of the book is that the importance of being a generalist in a specialized area so if uh, the, uh, the book says it talks about the ceos who have done wonders and who innovators so if you see that they are all in their 50s or you know after 50s they have done wonderful things because they have dabbled with different different aspects so i can tell about uk so what do you if you are planning your career in the uk or you want to apply what looks good on your cv is that they they don't want you to have done three years of orthopedics they want you to have done a little bit of vascular surgery little bit of plastic surgery little bit of emergency medicine so when the person comes to them they say okay this is a person who has seen the world who has seen different different specialties he is a good generalist so he will be able to get out of the situation when the radial artery is lacerated or he will be able to you know predict what happens when a compartment syndrome is there or a nerve is injured so he is got a range and now he wants to specialize in one thing it also works the other way that when you have a range you can bring in the best part of one uh, specialty into others like for example now endoscopic spine is coming in but a lot of concepts have been borrowed from uh, yes, soft tissue yes. uh, uh, scopies for example you know uh, arthroplasty was leading the innovations uh let's say in the late 1980s or 90s but the same concepts are now being borrowed by the spine surgeons uh, with regards to the near modern instrumentations you know them moving away from anterior surgery to posterior and now coming back anterior so you it's best to have a range initially 
and then settle in a subspecial area. Siddharth would like to add something here. So, uh, the, one of the most important factors is there is no pressure of time. I think uh, one of the things which sort of gets into our minds, especially in residency, is that as soon as you finish residency, there has to be a decision to take a specialty. It is true to a certain extent, but what has to be kept in mind is this something that you are going to do for the rest of your life. You can't be in a position that after five years into a particular specialty, you feel that that's not right fit for you. You will, there's always going to be an option to go back, but those five years have gone. So spend time and don't rush into making a decision because there is no peer pressure. Once you've finished your MS, once you've got your degree, your only enemy is you. Like, there is no other competition around which you have to tackle. It's, yes. it's, it's a planning for the rest of your life which begins and it's like a mutual fund SIP. You know, it's a small amount but in the yes. longer run it, it gives you a dividend. I think there is one, uh, you know, a perception that you start your specialty or start earning as soon as possible after your MS. But I think most of us, uh, you know, most of the panelists here would tell you that spending at least four to five, minimum four to five years in pursuing and learning your specialty is going to make you uh, uh, more mature as a, a doctor and as a surgeon. Uh, so the next question really is that once you decide that this is my particular uh, subspecialty I want to uh, pursue, when is a good time to start applying for fellowships? Is it during residency itself? Or is it after residency? So when when did you start applying for your fellowships? Maybe you can start with Manit. So uh, like, like I've told you, I was exposed very early on. I had a direct interaction with my mentor. It's important if you want to apply for a fellowship, you reach out to the center, you talk to the mentor, get on in a discussion with them, understand what they require from you to come in as a fellow. That is the most important. What are your uh, basic requirements? Like I said, my mentor sent me back to complete a year of rotation through all specialties and then come back and confirm to him whether I really want to do this as a specialization and take it on for the rest of my life. So understand what is required of you before you start your fellowship. You can do that during residency. There's no problem. If your mentor says he wants two publications of you, start early on in residency. If he says he wants this much of years of training on you before he takes you on as a fellowship, start early on in residency, get into a dialogue that is the most important, understand what is required and achieve those requirements so that then you are straight away assured the position when you're, when it's time. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Parak sir, when did you decide that you had an affinity towards hands and uh, when did you commit? Honestly, uh, it, it will mostly happen uh, after your post graduation in my opinion because uh, it just it is very difficult to take that call during post graduation because of yes. other uh, you know uh, unnecessary liabilities of many things but uh, it happened to me uh, after my post graduation everybody has gone through the same we all were clueless and trust me like whoever like she is a pediatric ortho but she wanted to do something else so almost 60 to 70 percent of the people who are there today they wanted to become something else and they landed up you know becoming something else and uh, how you know to enter into this subspeciality you have to have you have to see yourself to, you know answer two questions where do you see yourself in next five to seven years and not from career point of view but from geographical point of view also so one thing decisions people usually now this generation take whether i am going to move abroad or i will come back yes okay. but of course everything is going to change everything is going to change once you are after five years india is going to be like a corporate practice and uh, you know the, the things are going to become better Yes. But uh, decision is uh, what you see, you are going to, uh, you know, go into that speciality more. The things that you are less exposed, you will definitely have less attraction to that. Yes. But if you want to increase your horizon and in terms of thinking, start attending, you know, BOS courses, small courses. That is the best thing that we should do. You know? uh, do hand surgery course, pediatric ortho course, arthroplasty course. Do these courses because you know, you immediately get separated amongst the, you know, 5,000 postgraduate people to immediately 20, you know, course, 20 people who are attending that course. 
and suddenly you have one guidance. So whatever you have left out or missed during your post graduation, you are immediately get exposed to that particular you know faculty mentor course during that. So it is my recommendation if you cannot decide in during your PG or within one year of PG, try to do courses you know in various sub specialties. Specialties. It will definitely help. You. Yes, and a lot of times your life decisions and your life situations also play a role. You have to take all that uh, into account. Yes. Uh, so, in terms of applying for fellowships, uh, there is always a lag period. Yeah. So, how soon you know should one start for formally applying for fellowships? When do you think that you know is a good time to start formally applying for fellowships? I think the yeah you have to be generalist as Dr. Ashish mentioned. Yeah. But because of competitive. Imagine you are not the only one who is applying from Mumbai or your local region or from wherever you have done the PG. The entire world is approaching for that particular post. That has to be very clear. Okay. And the entire world also have those powerful or you know influential mentors. So you have to think about it in time frame if you want me to answer is at least within two years whether I am going to do a general trauma practice with some interest in scopy plasty hand or onco some certain like that or I am going to be a specialist. specialist. Trust me irrespective of the money that you are going to get during your fellowship which is that is also a myth that I will earn less I will not begin. If you start your practice immediately you, you are not going to start earning immediately. Yes. And trust me the moment you enter into any subspeciality the path is so encouraging and nice you know the moment you enter into hand surgery suddenly attending conference you are interested in congenital hand micro brachial plexus something like that so and everybody pays you know either in terms of time or knowledge or money so you are not going to you know lag behind earning yes. you will keep earning during those fellowship it is only starting a practice that is the discussion, discussion. not earning money well, fellowships are unpaid, but they are paid in lot of terms. Ajit, yes, you learn within two years. Life you skills. have to make a call to join any subspeciality. After that, the lucrative capacity of uh, orthopedic practice, you know, uh, it goes in your mind, and very, very likely, you know, you will see why should I take that risk if I see hundred patients in OPD and charge five hundred rupees, you know, and uh, do injection practice, do KY in practice. It is not bad. You know, and you don't. You will settle that with South Bombay also, and three tire, uh, two tire cities also, with that mindset. Yes. But take that call with you. Yeah, but most of the fellowships, uh, they have a lag period. So there are, you know, you, there's a waiting period. As if you apply now, you'll get it after two, three years. So in terms of application process, in. Uh, as madam said that initially you work in a unit and then you realize and then once you start applying you suddenly realize that the next available fellowships is two years from now so how do you fill in you know that gap what do you do to uh, make the most of those two three years so i'll just start by answering sorry yes one question. so uh, when to apply you know you'll have to actually make hundreds of applications i think everyone sitting here has made hundreds, hundreds of applications absolutely and things are very easy now because of portals like what dr ashok shah has started you know a portal pay you come to know everything nhs.net pay you get to know notifications so we had applied at an era when they were all postal applications and uh, as dr parak said imagine there are thousands of people from scandinavian countries bangladesh pakistan sri lanka everyone who's fighting you they don't know you're from cyan or you're from km or you're from uh, sancheti or any other place for them everything is the same so what matters is your referee but if you don't have a good referee or a powerful referee just start applying and my tip will be to have different cvs for different uh, sort of applications there will be some applications where they would want a senior uh, registrar yes. course, someone who would want junior course. So you have to tone up your level of experience or tone down your level of experience, tone up your expectations, your uh, life aim, ambitions according to those. So yes. just make sure you have 10 or you know, not 10, but at least 6, 7 different uh, sounding CVs. Yes. Either for different countries, positions. And perhaps talking to the previous fellows in that particular fellowship. That helps a lot to know what exactly they want out of a fellow and what stage of career do they want a fellow to be in. Yeah, so even when you are applying, when you start applying in the month of Jan, by Feb you would have got an idea, okay, this is working or this is not working for me. So you will keep on changing those. So you saw the sequence, whether it is a consultant led fellowship or a societal fellowship or a, a country thing. So you will have to tight, I mean, uh, sound, make your CV according to that particular specifications. 
I think Siddharth wants to add something. Yes. So just building upon that, uh, timing of application actually starts when you are in residency and that's uh, Dr. Parag has actually highlighted that. It starts with the courses because uh, one of the things that is going to count on your CV is your previous experience getting exposure to your specialty or a different specialty. The course will do both the things. It will help you get exposure to all to be able to decide and secondly when you are ready to apply you will have done those courses to go on your uh, application because once you decide then if you start pursuing the course something like an AO basic or AO spine or AO trauma course it adds that time because most of these applications to stand out from the crowd you need these smaller nuances on your application because although you can apply multiple times but you know your first impression is the best one so you would want those smaller things to be ready by the time you are ready to apply or once you've decided to apply for a special so, Siddharth, how was your timeline? So you went, you started your Nottingham Fellowships in 2018 or 19. Right. So when did you apply? When did you get accepted? So, so uh, in my case, it was a biased decision because I had, uh, in Cyan, we did not have uh, arthroscopy when I was there. So exposure was out of the three years of residency, I had almost a year and a half uh, of spine, two years of spine. And the liking and the fondness came by second year and third year, my whole year of my Dr. Goregaokar was spent in spine and the SMO year was under Dr. Goregaokar. Mean. So it was a bias choice made early. So I started application. So your residency was in spine essentially. Uh, residency was practically in spine <laughs> because first year otherwise was uh, blank. So uh, applications I started as soon as I gave my MS exam. So in the time, even for the foreign fellowships, because you, you by then so you decided about. that time it about was not spine, more yeah. of fellowship; it was more for observership. So I Correct. did my first observership uh, in my SMO year as soon as I started. So uh, that and that in knowledge came from talking to peers. So there was no; it was not more of a self research, but it was more talking to like forums yeah. like these. So that's where and I did the observership more to get on the CV the, ob the observership was in Hong Kong for a complex deformity correction which I had no clue about yes right. so but I knew that at some point that will count for something Correct. and then came the ASSI fellowship uh, the two years of ASSI was spent in planning so it's again it's all about the what's the next uh, thing yes and you get one thing and then you start you planning, start planning while you're doing I, that first thing Correct. So the in the second year of ASSI fellowship was when I applied for the Nottingham UK. Spine Fellowship. And yes. the the time between me getting selected for UK and me starting was year and a half. Correct. So, so I exactly that's what I meant. UK there. Yes. almost quarter to two years before the fellowship started. actually started. Because so that's why the highlight is time is going to be long. Yes. So you need that void filler to be there. Exactly. But you need to plan. And so you need to it. fill up that time with some with worthwhile uh, job which is you know exactly. uh, adding to your skills and uh, helping you in your eventual Absolutely. Goals. So what I would suggest is if there is no like I had a ASSI fellowship but just in case if I didn't have my plan B was to approach a mentor directly to have Correct. a six months or a one year under them even if it doesn't pay. Correct. Because I think at that point as Sir said it's not about the money it's yes. about just getting that experience and making most of the time. Uh, sir wants yeah. to add something. To fill up the gap, you know, uh, for example, I wanted to apply for a hand surgery fellowship in Singapore. Paperwork for was one year and after that they will choose whether I will get the fellowship and something like that. So the best way to fill up this gap is you have to spend money. You have to attend their national conference and try to present your work as a case report, as a poster presentation. So suddenly in a Singapore hand society meeting, there were only 12 Indians, out of 12, 9 were faculty and 2 were some like me, you know, at the age of 28 or 29 and when I met somebody who was a fellowship coordinator or in charge and you know, G. Uzuri, in terms of very ethical and scientific way, sir, I have applied for this fellowship, my paperwork is going on and I have presented this poster or free paper. Suddenly that gap becomes yes. you know, reduced to significant. You have to make yourself people. visible. Yes. Because they understand by looking at me, probably they make an impression that you know, am I good, bad? So they will ask three, four questions and immediately they will uh, who will who was your reference? I told them that I nobody has referred me yet. Okay. So they will just call, okay, from where you have done your post graduation. The moment you say city Mumbai, they know somebody who is 30 years senior to me. How is Parag? Ah, he's good, good, okay, he has applied. 
I am very sure your timeline will, you know. Yes. So try to attend their local meetings, but not to clap. You present. Yes. You present and meet people in any yes. terms. So I think networking plays an important role in uh, getting fellowships. So uh, perhaps Manit, you again, can tell us again, about if meetings, presentations, or just go and observe. Like I said, get a one-to-one -one face on interaction. You apply for multiple fellowships, you will get multiple rejections. Write back to them. I'm okay for a month's uh, observership. I'm okay for six weeks observership. I'll come at my own money. Let me come and just have a look at your center and let me just come and see how things work. I think it is important for them to find out that you are reliable, you are relatable, you are hard working and reasonably honest. So that happens after a one to one interaction. Right. So I, I know I am sort of jumping the uh, session a little bit but to question to both of you because both of you have worked in the UK. Now uh, if you have to decrease the timeline or do something in the meanwhile, the most uh, predictable path to follow a specialty probably is to go to UK. Absolutely. Yes. So would you recommend that you know while uh, they are at their stages in the career, probably most of them are post MS, maybe one or two years, that they mentally start planning for the country where uh, language is not a barrier, predictive path is predictable. Yes. And then uh, once you land. Yes, absolutely. I mean, that is what my thinking was when I chose to go to UK. And I think other th another thing, as Sir said, where you are in your life also makes a decision. My, I was already married and my wife is also uh, she's an ophthalmologist. So for both of us to get fellowships in the same country, I think UK was a, uh, there's no other option really other than uh, UK. Also, uh, while in UK, you're working as a registrar, so you're learning on the job. So till you get an eventual fellowship, you're not really wasting that time. You're earning and you're uh, gaining skills. So uh, that is why for me, I think UK was uh, a, a very straightforward option. And I'll, I'll cover that in my uh, talk as well. Uh, so yes, so networking definitely helps. And as uh, Dr. Samir Dalvi said in his uh, talk, that eventually, especially in, in the foreign countries, word of mouth has a uh, bigger impact than you know hundreds of publications which one might have. And it is very important that if somebody picks up the phone, especially on your behalf and uh, puts in a word, then that carries more weightage than uh, 10 pages of CV, personal recommendation. Uh, but still, I feel that uh, CV also has a role. And how much do you feel you know publications make a difference when you apply for uh, fellowships? So I think uh, uh, application as that we send is eventually a piece of paper. So Correct. that paper has to reflect uh, who you are. So there are two parts on any application which I feel are very important. One is the research aspect. Uh, probably we'll cover that in the research talk. But the research aspect, uh, and this is from my personal experience being on the interview committee for Nottingham where the research was not done to see the the numbers but it actually just showed that acumen to be able to because when i when you publish a paper you will do a literature review you will yes. write up you will take the efforts if it's a clinical study to do data analysis statistics uh, cross reference do a plagia check do the publication do the uh, follow editor up sends back do the follow up so it's that effort which counts and not the actual uh, the uh, actual publication, like for my own exam, my first three publications were non PubMed indexed journal. In fact, my first one was in a journal called European Journal of Biomedical and Pharmaceutical Sciences. <laughs> right, it, it counted for nothing, but I still yes. paid 2000 rupees for that publication because I knew that that would be probably just the first step to. It establishes a, you know, at least a tendency that it, it's, you're going to be a part of that process, able to second, process things. second part of the application which I feel is good, very important is your personal statement. I don't know, I think we may cover that in the application. With a personal statement is where you write who you are and what yes. you want from the fellowship, which every fellowship mentor would look at. They probably will not see how many surgeries you have done. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and uh, the, the other thing I feel is important in terms of publications is that most of these high volume centers, they have uh, fellowship mentors who themselves are very busy. So they don't have time to publish their own work, to process their own work. So when you apply with, uh, you know, evidence of being published, and you know, when you show a tendency to be able to process data and churn out papers, you are indirectly you know, telling them that whatever data you have, which is unpublished yet, 
I'll be able to churn that and you know give you uh, a few publications because eventually it's a two-way thing. You are gonna get some things out of the fellowships, but what do you bring to the table as trainees? There's not much you can give, but this is definitely one thing where you can be an asset to the, uh, the, the unit where you're working in to publish their data. I think that tendency is established uh, in your CV if you've already got uh, uh, a few publications. So, madam, you wanted to add some, yes. So, uh, I think apart, publications might hold 20 to 30 percent importance in a CV. What they look out is how, uh, what other courses we have done, like a basic life support or a pediatric advanced life support. So, for me, it was an additional thing that I had done PALS from the Accredit American program. So, that was an additional thing and every time I went for the fellowships, the initial what we do induction here, they used to have a BLS program yes. for all the fellows. So I did that two, three times and they were very happy that I had done the pediatric advanced life support. So doing a basic AO course, a basic life support, all this additional ATLS. Things, uh, ATLS all this add to the CV. So in the UK you cannot be a registrar or a fellow unless you have an ATLS, uh, certified ATLS trainer. And they put some like a sticker or badge on your uh, cards that they know that you are a BLS, you have done and you have the capacity to save someone. someone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that is important and apart from that you should also show as a personal person what all hobbies you have, what you read or something has to come up. Because they are not all the time like academic, academic. They also, they enjoy life more than us actually. <laughs> Other countries have a much more better quality of life. And they look out that what this person does other than just working. So I think you could just, uh, apart in the statement purpose, the purpose statement or SOP, the statement of purpose, you can always put down what other things you do other than the ortho part also. You wanted to add something, so, Manitha? Again, I mean, we, we lay a lot of stress on publication, but like every all, all of us have said that the, the paper is the most important thing which your mentor or whoever is going to select you is going to read. So, right, it may be insignificant to you right now, but write about it. How many journal uh, presentations are you doing? It may be a poster, just say. 20 presentations in the course of five years, it may be a regional conference, it may be national. Say, you, they don't need the topics, they just need you to know you've done so many presentations, podiums, Correct. Uh, posters, you have, you've won awards, you, you, you know, participate in courses. They want to know how interested you are in the subject. They don't want to look at those 20 publication titles or your presentation titles and but they want Absolutely. to know you're interested and you're taking the effort and you're continuously involved with, you know, involved in learning and teaching and everything. You wanted to add something, sir? Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. small, uh, you know, it, I will open a matter for debate and people may not agree with okay. that. <laughs> That's what we are here for. Please, go ahead. Presentation weightage is more than 80% rather than publications. You have to be extremely smart. But if you go there and really show your too much interest before and during uh, fellowship publications, you will be taken out from clinical work and given a research fellowship. Okay? So please be very, very careful. To Your aim is to enter into the system and go through their website what matters to enter into the system. If they want more publications, yes, it requires. But otherwise, you know, one of my very good clinical fellow colleague, he was taken out in our, you know, we were selected both together in Louisville, Kentucky for hand surgery fellowship and he published almost around 60-70 articles before he reached there and we were both given a clinical fellowship and within three months we were offered 5000 US dollar salary and he was given 7500 US dollar salary and they told him that out of one year of clinical fellowship you go six months into research fellowship and six months into clinical fellowship, okay. He, he thought I will be able to take out time and come, you know, and do clinical work. But it's a completely structured program, research fellowship. They will, you know, make, make sure, sure you churn out papers. Publish, yeah. And they will give, uh, they, there will be, it's a different team, statistician, this, that, PSM people. So <laughs> Sometimes it can work against you. Yeah, yeah. But I think that is an exception rather than the... <laughs> So, I mean, uh, again, to emphasize the same point that, you know, make sure where you're applying. 
because I, and that is a very important point Dr. Nikhil made that you know they are looking so what you are bringing to the table you know I am offering fellowship to this fellow he is already knows how to publish so basically he will help me publish because ultimately you have to remember that those people are getting a grant or getting a, a fellow's position yeah. financed by someone else and that someone else either might be wanting to evaluate his particular screw his joint his newer technique or Botox injection or whatever so they yes. don't want the paper at the end of it that is one Secondly, you might be applying for jobs where actually they want someone to work in the world and that is where publications may not count too much. So you might be lucky over there. But my sincere advice will be to make sure that column is filled. That is one. Secondly, if you are the person who has a recent bet of by all means that's a very good fellowship and good program to get get up there. Because when you're a senior, then they are going to look at your JPJS publication, journal of very very heavily in your favor. I think that's okay. uh, can you have uh, As all of you are saying that there is a waiting period for two years. So like for example I start applying today. Uh, in the next two years whatever I do maybe for example if I'm applying for a plastic fellowship somewhere in Australia. In the next year if I do further two more fellowships one year one year how do I convey to them that in the last two years I have done <laughs> because two years will be a very big time. <laughs> Ten lectures. Thing. How does that institute come to know that I have further trained myself in that? So generally, these fellowships are filled. You know, the spots are filled in advance. So now, what you are applying for might be a 2020 fellowship. So in two years time, it will be a 2028 fellowship. So your 2026 application will be based on what you have on your CV today. So it, those next years will be whatever for the next year's fellowship. So they would send a letter of approval anyways. If you get in, if you get in. Your application is accepted and you're waiting. It's not the uh, opening hmm. of post. So, what is so when Siddharth so, yes. so said one and a half years, he was already selected for the fellowship. Already selected. Based on his CV at that point, he was selected and his fellowship started one and a half year later. So, so for your two year later I start, the, the two year period yes. doesn't matter. Because you've already been selected, selected now and then you spend that two years to fill the void. Because the application, the course starts two years after the selection. Correct. And uh, how big of a hindrance is a language barrier? Like, if if we choose a six months fellowship, which is in Korea, probably. So I I was born and brought up in Mumbai. When I went for my PG in Mysore, I took first three months to learn Kannada. So if that kind of a problem I face, like for example, if I get some some opportunity in Korea and in Australia, so how big will the language barrier be? So Madam has spent a lot of time in if Korea. If I'm a clinical student there. And, and uh, the software you put your name in Korean language. So it was a difficult thing and I did additional Korean classes on Saturday Sundays. So you have to learn a bit of things because... Even so reading you have to... Even yeah, reading. Even read. So I could read the names and I could see. Oh. You don't have to interact with them because there's always a R2, R3 who will guide you. And as a fellow, you are treated very nicely. So you don't have to read or worry much. The Korean seniors, they are trained in the US. So they all speak nice. To a nice big city, if you go to small cities and smaller provinces, it's difficult. Seoul and Incheon and these places, yeah, you'll have everyone speaking English around. But patient interaction is going to be a hurdle. No, so patient interactions is always the physician assistant. Okay. Bosses, assistants interact and the R1 or the R2 will interact. The fellow doesn't need to interact. Sorry, what are R1 and R2? The residents? The resident. Okay, yeah, sorry. Resident. So the fellow just starts, stands next to the boss and they discuss the cases. And the R1, R2 will take the history, they will type for barrier. Simple things like name and all you need to read for it, which case is being shifted and you can't be dependent. So it's easy to learn, not a difficult thing. I think Australia problem. won't be a problem. I think. How much Australia time did you take to manage this? Like for example, if it is a six months fellowship, so how much time would I probably take to learn that language so that I can... Like two, three sessions you'll learn to read the names. 
they are very simple they are phonetics just like what we learn hindi and marathi it's very simple how much time did you take to learn in mysore yeah, maybe right. that will give an idea i almost took two to yeah, now, now you can use yes. the manageable kannada ha uh, you can use the translating apps those those guys are really advanced those girls and guys they use the translators and they show you even so now you have google translate as yeah. well you can just so even then they used yeah. to do this with me so i think now they must be much more better when it comes to once you're selected you have time to start applying for paperwork you'll apply for a visa you'll apply for travel permits you'll and apply take for some work language work. lessons in this in, you have a lot of time at the same time you up, you apply for some language skills as well thank you so i don't think so the, you have to make a good rapo with local staff yeah. residents and staff the mm. nursing staff ward boys yes you yes know, you just make them a good rapo indians are very good at it you know they love no, uh, yes uh, order they coffee for it. people and they love it they have yeah a lot of stories to tell they they love they know bollywood lot no, you will really <laughs> love it and i think it is a matter of one week to 10 days you will accustom to their system it is so well you are not the first indian going there so they know that you don't know their language they they definitely will help you it is not the yeah, it's not a <coughs> see we don't have to deal with the the like i have also done my fellowship in coimbatore and i learned tamil in first one month and i went to singapore where 80% per patients are chinese chinese speaking you may have a setback once in your lifetime during the fellowship that you know the the patients prefer they tell the staff that i want a local language speaking doctor i don't want to you know they don't need it but they, it is like you know some patient comes to me in a maharashtrian language and if i am not able to satisfy their questions or doubts they have right to you know ask somebody who, who knows, knows marathi yeah. so that may you may face it once i have faced it that's why just a technical off shoot there is a very nice app called duolingo so which is fantastic very easy interface if you want to learn basics of something new or language wise wherever you are going so uh, the language issue which you mentioned in korea was actually a blessing in disguise for me because uh, i went there for a very specific uh, spine endoscopy training and uh, because i could not interact in that language they cut off all my opd days so it was monday to friday ot <laughs> so there is no emergency duty there is no opd interaction you just have to do ot and uh, publish for the bosses because their english is poor in in return uh, you can do some paperwork for the bosses any other questions i think there is someone there at the back how many of you have already start uh, are most of you trainees you finished your ms can i have a show of hands how many are still in training so all of you are a second or third year residents and the rest of them are, have completed uh, have any of you already chosen your sub specialties or have any particular affinity to one particular sub specialty or not yet so you have chosen so i think the ones who have already finished their training are perhaps the ones who are committed sorry yes go ahead with the question thank you so much for the sessions one question which comes to mind when we are selecting an indian fellowship versus a foreign fellowship is the volume which one would encounter so two sub questions in this category a how uh, relevant is the volume in doing a fellowship and b how much actually is the volume difference between india and say for example uk or australia which uh, for a person like me who has not been there i presume it would be a very large difference but then uh, for people like you who have already been there worked there so how much is the on ground difference in the volumes between india and those countries and how much does it make a difference in our practice thank you uh, i'll begin with myself yes yes please indians we have lot of volume and uh, abroad there is definitely less volume that is the answer of the question and how much does it matter see you have to see everything multiple times okay so the first brachial plexus i did is was in my private practice i never ever did a brachial plexus surgery in my four fellowships of one year each duration okay but by the time i did my first brachial plexus i had seen assisted around 150 brachial plexus surgeries so indians definitely have lot of volume foreign fellowships are chosen for different reason that discussion we will do it later but the volume definitely matters but why in spite of having less volume in abroad 
why it is more important, you know. Uh, do I need to answer that question or we will take that in? No, you can please go ahead. See, it is not only uh, you need to go to abroad because see here you will keep on doing cases, keep on doing cases. Very few institute in this country, uh, they base, they publish or they keep record, maintain their data. See, volumes and, and you know the data or record keeping in abroad and the collaboration with rehabilitation department for keeping scores and you know analyzing patients at three weeks whatever at six months is amazing and that's where we get time to learn in abroad the second point is uh, you know analysis of uh, you know no discrimination in terms of uh, post you know somebody who is a uh, like ward boy or like here Dr. Nikhil is telling Chasnal Madam, Parak Sir, Ashish Sir, this sir business goes away in one week. Unless you've been knighted, you're not a sir. <laughs> yeah, so so that's why that is what we need to learn. Yeah, yeah. Work life balance. So the, in abroad people work AM or PM. Like the session starts at 7 to 12 or 1 to 5. So Monday to Friday, two sessions in a week are devoted for all people in a research. Research. Yeah. You understand? So there, what volume you have already seen or there you have seen, you are, you can take one topic, like one particular topic and you can do, use that during your research time. So you get a time to do in your own specialty of fellowship, uh, you know, apart from clinical work, you get time to publish or see their present, I mean, you know, work. So that's why, that's why abroad fellowships are extremely important. Also, I feel as far as the volume is concerned, the kind of pathology you're dealing with also matters. Because in, I mean, the, the population of India is so much. So the pediatric problems will obviously be more in number in India. Neglected ones, yeah, not picked up at yeah. birth. Because, I mean, I've not done any pediatric fellowships in the UK. But I remember in the entire region, there was just one pediatric orthopedic surgeon. Because everything, DDH, CTV, everything used to pick, be picked up so early and acted upon so early that very few kids actually came on the OT table for surgery. Uh, and they have a very strong system of, you know, uh, paramedical staff, nurses uh, uh, for evaluation of CP and so many other things. And they're managed at a much uh, lower level by these uh, paramedical staffs. I think, yeah, volume wise we are very good, but when it comes to record keeping, multidisciplinary approach, a teamwork like having a, a physio, another staff, uh, somebody for evaluation, an otist, all that they excel of course. Their numbers are less, when it comes to skill building we are much more ahead. Compared to their fellow, we as fellows here would have done more work. So hands on work of course we have done much more better in India. What we go for in for a foreign fellowship is to learn additional extra things which we are not doing here. To learn more minute details or finer details of the work. Otherwise, I think uh, if we keep the same amount of record keeping and do the same kind of work, we'll be far more ahead when other than the other countries in that case. So uh, I have a slightly different opinion on that. Sorry, sir, if I may interrupt. So as far as hands-on work is concerned, I think for so specialties like arthroplasty or arthroscopy, I really don't think that there are so many hands-on opportunity av available in India. And so, uh, to just elaborate on the point, I was going to say the same thing, the volumes matter, there is no doubt about it, but you are at a stage in your career when even by seeing volumes, you can imbibe certain things unless it is arthroscopy. Okay, we don't have more, the arthroscopy is a different set of skills where you need to have that uh, hand-eye coordination, triangulation and things like that. Uh, why volume does not matter over there because everything there is structured including the referral service. So uh, as a trainee you would want to see repetition of the same thing, you know, four hips in a day, four knees in a day or you know maybe two unis, two totals and then uh, maybe a scope here and there. So there maybe you will have only two OT days but then you will have two OPD days built up with that. Now again as uh, uh, Dr. Nikhil said, like, let's consider arthroplasty for matter. You may have a very high volume center even in Bombay, but are you actually going to get anything uh, uh, of substance in that? You know, maybe you might expose the knee once, maybe you might position the knee, but you will never get to uh, let's say balance the knee to the optimum or execute a total knee replacement. Things may be a little different in spine surgery because of the quantum of the disease. You know. Someone like an Arvind Kulkarni, I don't know if you know him, he's got a huge volume. So it is possible that when he's running two theatres or like a Vishal Kundan, you will get to do bits and pieces. So that is sufficient in fellowship because that is what at that at level you are. Because you have seen the basics in your training. Now you are there for fine tuning your skills and eventually you will do, do execute that whenever either you are an associate professor or a lecturer in a medical college 
or you come back to your practice. So volumes matter. We have higher volumes, but there the volumes, though they are more lower in numbers, they are more structured. Yeah. So you tend to gain more out of those volumes. I, I don't know. You Siddharth want wants to add something. So uh, orthopedics, when we do, it's about knowing something about everything. But when you go to a specialty, is now knowing everything about something. All right. So more you see that same thing over and over, the more you gain insight into what is to be done and what is not to be done. So uh, definitely volume plays a role even if you keep seeing the same microdiscectomy a, a thousand times because that one thousand one time when you get the chance to do it, you would have seen it enough by your mentor to know what exactly the steps are to be followed. And it's a mental, it's a muscle memory that you developed even by seeing it. So volume matters to get that finessed memory to keep running over and over again in the same loop. Uh, secondly, even like speaking UK and spine. So two halves of the spine. So in the UK, because of the structure being the way it is, the mandation is the senior fellow always does his half of the spine. Even if it's the senior most consultant, he will expose his half, then he will give me the cautery and the cops, right? To expose my half. I will put screws on my side, he will put screws on his side. So that helps uh, because there is a structure to the training. Yes. So that that factor also in spite of the same point, because the in spite of the volume being low, there are two OTs a uh, um, a week and it's like a government hospital, not more than two cases a day. So five o'clock everything closes, everybody goes home, has a beer. But uh, it, you still get uh, valuable inputs even if you're doing just two cases in the yeah. week. Your contribution is much your more than what? Much higher, but that builds up on the base form from uh, yes. the Indian fellowship. Right. So again, I read my base has to be coming from the I You want to add something? Yeah. So again, I would say that uh, the volumes are massive here, but short in the in the long run i would say the numbers don't matter because it will turn out to be the same you see 20 spine patients in opd today you will you'll end up with two minimally invasive spine opportunities in those 20 patients there you see two patients who have been referred for by surgery yeah by multiple uh, screenings yeah. they have ultimately reached you and they are only two patients who are for minimally invasive spine so out of the 20 patients you will say oh with big volumes we have 20 patients here but ultimately the end goal is those two patients yeah. You achieve both of them in the in the same manner. Your you are doing the yes. filtration there. It's been filtered through the system. Yes. One final question because we'll be soon breaking for lunch. When and how do you decide that yes, I am done with my training? See, training is a perpetual process. But when do you take that decision of you know uh, going into private practice and calling yourself a spine surgeon or a hand surgeon or a pediatric orthopedic surgeon? So wh where when does one decide that I am adequately trained now to be on my own and enter private practice? I'll talk about myself. I couldn't make the call and I had to ask my mentor <laughs> on his face. You think That's I very need honest. to enter practice and he's like, you should. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I think it's ongoing process like we Yes, do. yes. So couple but somewhere one has to start. Yeah. yeah. So you can't be a chronic fellow, you know, there are some fellows who are chronic fellows. <laughs> they do fellowship for 10 years, 8 years and they're enjoying life because Half of the time you, whatever you have been hearing is the serious part, but fellowship is fun yes. and it's really nice. So after two, three years, you should come back, join as a junior consultant somewhere and side by side start building your practice. And then there will be some surgeries or you will find there is some shortcoming and you should go back, learn it at some other place, do a short term program again and gradually spread out your own practice eventually. So three to four years, I think, is a must to get into any subspeciality. Yes. So because then you become a master of that speciality, and you can always have a friend, a group practice, or someone whom you can rely on in cases of very difficult surgeries. Even after fellowship, you just can't come and take yeah. up the most difficult case. So there's no harm in having a friend yeah. or being in a group. Also, practice. the context which you develop, I and mean, I'm still in, you know, WhatsApp touch with my fellowship mentors and whenever there are complex cases I can just send them a text and have their opinion and their perspective on uh, how to go about with things. I think that call you will get that call you know when to go <laughs> back and start because you have done national international fellowships and during those two three years you are going to travel come back to your local place attend meetings and you will realize with discussing your mentors in this country like uh, you know I have done this much now and then you will get that call, but yeah, two, two and a half to three years, I think 
that time by that time you will you know decide whether you want to be on that side of the uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Or in India. Very difficult. Very difficult. Yeah. How did you decide? I think Siddhartha? there will be a personal aspect to that discussion as well. Yes. So yes. that decision will also not just be a professional one. Uh, it will also matter how uh, if if you're married, what the what the partner wants to do, where they are, because it's it's both the careers uh, which you are looking for. So it it's definitely going to be an individual decision. But definitely one thing is to keep in mind what where you want to end up like if you have a plan to come back to india uh, i would say again 3 to 4 years is a good timeline basically that timeline is before you become complacent there because wahan pe you know you get that it's salary. very easy to it become complacent. easy life it's yeah, a absolutely. balanced life and if that cycle doesn't break uh, then uh, like one of my senior uh, colleagues who who used to mention if you want to go back to india go before you have a kid Right, yes. because once the kid enters the education system, it's very difficult to come back. Yeah, so, there are many factors. So yeah. there are a lot of other factors, but you need to keep that end point in mind. Yeah, I want to go back, and then find your moment of calling. Sir, when one does one decide that I'm done with fellowships now and I can I'm an independent surgeon. When does one uh, know? <laughs> Yeah, so as you know, Parag said, that call will come. So a lot of times it is very easy to get lured into something deeper, deeper, deeper. Because see, what you have to remember is you have to talk, you have to network, network, and network. And the same thing goes on over there. Now you are presenting a paper of your fellowship. You present it to someone who is sitting as a chair. But he said, "Oh, this looks very interesting. Why don't you come to Oxford?" He said, "Why are Oxford who are you? Oxford will come. Then Oxford will come. Then Cambridge will come. Then you come to Cambridge. So then you get lured into that." And then a point will come in everyone's life when you will decide whether I want to stay there or I want to come back. Then secondly, what is happening to your family and your uh, social circles, and then uh, whether you are at a point to uh, start practice on your own. And one very important thing to remember is that you can never finish finish a fellowship or all the procedures. Like you know, two yes. important points yes. from discussion. Doctor Parag mentioned the first uh, brachial plexus surgery he did was as a private practitioner after finishing the fellowship. As Doctor Chastan said, you will need. a uh, sort of a friend uh, like they, they say 2 am friends you know that was he is also done pediatrics you also done pediatrics there is a complex problem you don't want to let go of the patient at the same time at the earlier point in your career you, you know you don't want to refer him to elsewhere but you want to give a good outcome ultimately to the patient so you need to have a local mentor who would be there ki theek you do it i'll be there beside you or you need to have a friend so fellowship is never going to be that you have done all the possible procedures in the syllabus wo kabhi nahi hone wala hai and to be honest one thing i realized during some of my fellowships especially at the referral centers is that there are problems to which even they don't know the solution and in fact in specialist centers most of the cases are like that so one of my fellowship mentors used to tell me that you know whenever you see a happy patient in the opd please let them meet me because i just end up meeting all the unhappy patients Yes, yes, yes. Because if you're happy, you don't come back and see the consultant. So he used to actually tell me that if you have a, you know, happy patient, just come for a routine follow-up. Please let me meet because at the end of the day, everybody has their own set of emotions and you know which needs to be satisfied. So the, that's the other thing you realize that even at those centers, there are questions for which nobody knows and you know an answer to. And uh, uh, building those contacts in a way helps to discuss your complex problems with them and you know formulate a plan which is uh, workable so i think with that we'll uh, call an end to the first session uh, lunch is ready uh, are there any burning questions in anybody's minds yes at the back janki uh, can we have the mic there or you can shout if you can yeah hi good afternoon everybody i am dr janki chaudhary um, i'm just about to begin my third year at san hospital and uh, this is possibly a very uh, general question for all the panelists here uh, sir ma'am uh, what would your advice be to uh, someone like me who is starting off registrarship in a high volume place like sign hospital because i realized that I've, i'm at the end of two years here and they've gone by in, a, in the blink of an eye and i really still don't know how to learn how to learn so what would your advice to someone like me be and what sort of um, habits and attitude shifts uh, say in the opd in the or or in the wards would help me and hold me in good stead for uh, our, my future thank you 
Sir. Yes, please. <laughs> Very difficult question actually yeah, because… So, so basically, uh, believe me, all of us were in the same situation <laughs> when we were doing our PG, okay? Yes. So even at the end of two years of my KM, I was, you know, working with really big people, you feel like, you know, you're in the center of the universe, Dr. Lairi, Dr. Bosley, you don't need to go anywhere else. But at two years go very fast, you have not done anything. But fortunately, in uh, our institute, there was a legacy of doing at least something. Okay, and now when I tell our residents here that you should make an effort at least to, you know, so one thing every I want everyone to promise themselves from henceforth that you are not attending any conference in which you are not contributing. Okay, so do you understand what I mean to say? That be it a poster or a small, it could be case report we present, karo, but if you are going to that conference, you have to contribute to that conference. So once you start looking at things from that attitude, then you will start finding interesting cases. The first thing you can do is case reports. So let's say you're you're working in Cyan, right? So let's say you're working Dr. Vinodhi's unit. You will definitely some kid uh, see some child with a like you know complex problem. Will ask madam, you know, I want to write a case report. I want to get it on assistance. So the moment you start thinking of that, you start analyzing that, then you will start writing. There are other things which UK teaches us is maybe th things like audit doing certain things in the department which will improve the output of the department, which will improve the experience of the patients of the department. But I agree that might be very, very difficult in a place like Cyan, KM or any government college, but that is easily possible in a corporate setup, either in Bombay or in a, any other uh, city. Uh, so my advice would be to start with the basic case report, see what, what you find interesting, maybe a technical trip, try to write it up in a good manner. Now you have chat GPT, you have plagiarism checker, so writing becomes very easier and every publication has a home. So uh, be it a journal of pharmacokinetics <laughs> or whatever, you're, you don't have a publication and that would sort of, you know, uh, sort of, you know, light a spark or something like that. You go on to the next level. I think the easiest thing during residency is everybody has a thesis. I would say finish your thesis early and yeah. look for publishing your thesis. That's, it's compulsory, you have to do it. Most thesis today don't get published, so finish early and look for a journal. I think you'll always find some, you know, boss who inspires you. So, you know, as long as you find someone who inspires you to do one particular niche, I think you can just follow them. So I think trust me. I think everybody is in that shaky boat. Having that insight, I think, is important because not everybody realizes till the end of their residency that, uh, yes. So I think that's one good positive point. You have insight that you know the, it's uh, uncharted seas and unsteady waters. Yes, please, please go. Ahead. So first two years goes in just finishing the job for that day and going to back to the room and <laughs> having the meal or going out, and that's I think practically everybody's story. Absolutely, uh, yes. The major shift, probably one piece of advice would be, we have probably would have already done a patella fixation and this is from my personal experience. Uh, I learned my, I did my first patella in my uh, second first under the supervision of my uh, CR at that point of time. He told me what to do, he was unscrubbed, it was to morning 2 a.m. case. But when I did my first patella when I was a third year, was after I read Hoppenfield, knew the exposure. Uh, read something about patella fixation from some of the books just to see whether what I was doing till <laughs> now was fine or not. It's not that I was being taught wrong, but it's something just to develop the own insight into doing things yeah. differently if there is a need. So one advice would be to start doing the same thing after reading. So maybe the next year anyways is going to focus on preparing for the exam as well. So that would be a thought shift because when you start reading, you will find new ways of looking at the same issue. And uh, I think uh, I mean, we had a bond to do. Uh, so I think that is a very good opportunity because where you are bonded, you already finished your exams, you are being paid all right, you don't have that much responsibility. So that one year I think is very crucial in uh, you know thinking about things, figuring things out uh, and utilizing it to plan your next uh, journey. So Janki, if I have understood your concern properly, is in spite of spending two years in the department, you still feel that uh, you… Uh, that I haven't uh, made the best of correct. my time here. So and don't worry, the process has already started, okay. Your knowledge of orthopedics is definitely better than knowledge in dermatology, psychology, <laughs> correct. So one or, if you attend, you know, one or two social events in your own family and if your family member asks you, can you see this x-ray and comment? If you will be, I am very sure you will be able to comment. Are definitely you are seeing so much good volume. 
Absolutely. You are on the right track. By osmosis yeah. you are learning, yeah, 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 and yeah, by yeah, being a good right place. Track, so don't worry about it. <laughs> So, to uh, add on it, the very fact that you are here on a Sunday with us, you have already taken the first step. And uh, I, like Dr. Siddharth said that after doing a patella, he went back and read. The very first case that I operated was uh, IT fracture fixation. Probably everybody's first case was an IT. And uh, there was some problem with the reaming part of it. I don't know what went wrong, but the patient started bleeding on table. The very first case which I got is independent surgery. Actually, also she kept on bleeding. Program was done and it showed aneurysm in the forest. She had to JJ. That was the place where interventional radio was active at that point. They did some coiling, and uh, it was a very bad start to my first post, very first case that you do. But Dr. Srivastava, who was my mentor, told me to publish about it and it's my first case report. So, <laughs> things started rolling from there. So, bad start, but uh, worked out, I must say, in the end. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. I think we'll uh, break for lunch now. I really thank all the panelists. They have a busy practice and Sundays are, uh, you know, those opportunities which they uh, get time to relax with their families, have some own time, but still they took time out and uh, uh, came for this uh, event and uh, helped us with their wisdom. So thank you all uh, from all of us. Thank you. Thank you.